Now this is the part that I lost yesterday, mixing of the and pouring of the plaster. So I've got my molding plaster, sometimes called plaster of Paris. It's about a five or ten minute working time with this. If you use cold water, you can speed it up with hot water if you have the if you need to, but I don't want to. Uh, I ran a little short of uh, plaster, so I was a little more generous this time. And uh, I am going to wear a blue glove on that hand. I feel a bit of a sissy doing that, but you know, I had made thousands and thousands of molds, uh, poured uh, molds with plaster back when I was in my prime and a little business I had. And uh, none the worse for the wear on the old uh, hands, but they are rather grizzled, but that's due to. 70 years of hard work, probably not the plaster. Be back momentarily. The plaster is mixed. Hope it's not too soupy. Sales. Remember soupy sales? Pour it into one corner. Good, I got plenty of that time. Is that on camera? Just a little more. That's probably enough. I'm going to take the glove off. See, the whole idea was now I have clean hands. tap it. Sometimes I used to use a vibrator to get the bubbles out. Now I'll screed it off on the trusty Kmart paint stick. Kmart uh, store closed in our town. See, I wasn't able to do that on the other side because I ran low on plaster. So the two halves of my, uh, my first half probably won't be quite parallel. Doesn't look half bad. Now that has to harden. And I think I will wait till tomorrow so that, and I'll put that heat lamp on there and uh, demold it tomorrow. It's hard to wait that long, but I got a lot of other things to do and this project's already stretched on almost endlessly. Now, if you ever do something like this, do not wash your hands if you got plaster on them uh, in the sink where you will get that plaster into the plumbing. If you have it on your hands, have a slop bucket to do the initial washing. See you tomorrow. It is now at 8 o'clock in the morning, the next morning. The plaster is hard, but of course it's still quite wet to the feel, even though I had it under a heat lamp. Actually, it takes many days for it to actually dry. So uh, now I'm taking the screws out that are holding the two halves together, and I'm going to attempt to separate it. It came right apart with just the slightest prying of a, with a screwdriver and I had a little leakage right here of the plaster and right here I hope that isn't a problem but that that plaster there on the wood is pretty thin can you see my alignment nubs here pointy it looks like Madonna's bra now I'm gonna go over to the other bench I'm not gonna take the wooden uh, frame apart yet but I'm gonna try to get the pattern out of the plaster without breaking anything can you see the uh, glistening here of the Vaseline? That worked perfectly as a parting. Perfectly. I successfully withdrew the pattern from the mold and here's how I did it. I straddled the mold box with uh, two pieces of wood 
being careful not to uh, damage the plaster, laid a cross piece here. This is just something I came up with. And then I know this looks like a bit of overkill, but I used my Wonder Bar. And uh, I got a screw uh, screwed into the wood and just pried it up. It didn't take much pressure at all. And it popped out. And that's the part I was really worrying about. Will the whole thing explode as I pull it out? So out it came, and again, the Vaseline, remember I used Johnson's Paste Wax first, and the Vaseline really worked well. I, I don't think I ever, it's so long since I made one of these, you know, I had forgotten uh, some of the steps. Now, as far as the quality of the impression here, there is good, other than right there, there's an air bubble. I will fill that just with spackling compound or something of that nature and try to keep it smooth. Other than that, I don't see any bad spots. When I uh, was mixing the plaster, I was going to tell you this, but I forgot. I'm basically whipping it with my hand, and as uh, I mix and whip, and if you use some other kind of stirring device, it uh, incorporates air into the plaster. Also, as I poured the plaster in there, you know, I tried to pour it in one corner and let it flow, and it would drive the air out, but that didn't necessarily happen. And quite often, you will get air bubbles. Now, I was tapping the thing and banging it, also trying to get the air bubbles to, to rise, but uh, uh, I did miss one, and uh, I just have to deal with it. My next step, I will remove the uh, the wood mold box from both pieces. I'm still only halfway through the job, you know, because now all of these plaster uh, impressions need to be converted to cast aluminum. A lot of work for a lead hammer. I have removed the four corner screws with my trusty craftsman and remember there's hot glue on the corner so we'll see how that comes apart if at all not bad I like to work over paper so I don't have a mess on my workbench. It's kind of gooey with the Vaseline. And the Vaseline actually, uh, because it's thick and viscous, gave me a, uh, a finish here that I do not really like. Because you can see basically the way I smeared it on with my fingers. Same thing over here. Now again, this is way too thick. But uh, this is the wood I bought. I think they were one, one by twos. And uh, I only needed it, you know, a little thicker than this. And the only reason I care about that is that at some point as I mold this and turn it into uh, aluminum, the thick cross sections tend to cause shrinkage and uh, uh, hollow spots. There's the wooden pattern, the remnants of the mold boxes, and here are the two finished uh, products, semi-finished I guess you could say. And they are together now on the alignment pins that I talked about. This one is way too big and now you remember why I told you uh, that it is bigger. And it needs to be reduced in size so I will cut this down basically uh, on the pencil lines there that you see. And then I have to also uh, 
sand or in some way get a pattern draft on the sides of these so it'll pull out of the sand. Now this plaster is still so wet to the touch. This one of course feels a little drier. You can, you can tell by the feel of it. This one's drier because that I did a day and a half ago or whatever, a day ago. And uh, this is the fresh one. So what I'm going to do now is I got so many other projects and things to do. I'm going to stop for a couple days, set these on top of the water heater where it's kind of warm and uh, draw a little moisture out and then uh, try to figure out how I'm going to saw this uh, without making a mess. I'm not going to put it on the band saw because it also is rather abrasive but uh, I will rough saw it possibly just with a hacksaw blade and then throw the blades away. So uh, that's where we stand right now. Get back to you in a day or two. Well, it's not two days later. It's uh, seven minutes later, and I've been experimenting. And I tried a hand hacksaw as far as sawing this off. And uh, it, it would work. I used the coarsest blade that I had, but uh, it, it was slow going. So I immediately gave up. And uh, I did have one of these. I think you all know what this is. This is a drywall saw. Notice how coarse the teeth are. And um, so actually this is a wet wall now. But it, uh, it, I saw it right through that in a matter of uh, two or three minutes. Fairly straight. Even cut off a piece only about a quarter inch thick. Now this is going to be very weak. at this point. Well it won't be strong even after it dries but uh, when it's green like this there's just no strength at all yet because there's still a chemical reaction going on here that will harden it more but I'm thinking that it might be better for me to saw it now while it's still wet rather than wait until it's uh, dry but that's just a guess and I'm going to rough saw it just near the lines not uh, on the lines because I still want a little material left where I can uh, put that pattern draft on there that I just talked about. It's still the same day, but it's 8 o'clock, 8, 10 in the evening, and I haven't been working on this all day. I've been doing other things, but I just got back to this. But remember I said that I needed a pattern draft on the side, so I couldn't think of how to do that. But finally I just came up with this rather crude idea. I took a 2x4 and I sawed an angle on it. You see that we got about a, a three or four degree angle right here. And using this as a fence, I took the plaster and with this face up against the fence, went like this, just back and forth, back and forth. And this is real coarse, this is 60 grit paper, but in just a couple strokes, of course, the abrasive paper clog so I had to take it down to the floor clean it with a wire brush and then come back up and do some more and then when that side was done then I would do the ends and then the other side until all four sides had pattern draft then I took my sanding block and I chamfered or beveled all four corners here and rounded them a little bit and this is still rather moist but you know I was just thinking I kind of feel like Michelangelo or one of the other uh, Renaissance artists you know uh, what they did when they painted on wet plaster remember what that term was and that's why they these paintings lasted so long in the uh, Sistine Chapel and other buildings they painted on wet plaster that had not cured so they plastered and right away they did their painting so the, uh, the paints went down into the pores, and, and uh, they were a little bit more than surface deep in frescoes. But, uh, well, I'm no artist, but now these are actually about ready to take out in the garage to my foundry and ram up, using these as patterns, ram up another mold and pour aluminum in it. So... I might do that tomorrow if I'm in the mood. Good night all. It's two days later 
and I'm wanting to get out in my foundry. It's still cold outside. It's May 2nd and it's, uh, it's still oh, it was like 40 or 45 degrees when I got up and it's still only like about 50 so but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, the first thing I had to do in regards to, to making this casting now, these are the patterns. I've come a long way and uh, this is a Formica sink cutout. I went downtown and a man gave me a couple of these. There's Formica on the other side. Well you saw it the other day. Anyway, I had to make a molding board. So, the outer lines that you see here are the size of my flask, which is uh, uh, 10 by 12. Let's see. 10 by 12, the outer lines. And I, I determined that uh, I really need to make one of these at a time in a flask. Now I can use a much bigger flask but they're so heavy and so hard to handle I prefer to use the smaller flask, the 10 by 12. So what I had to do first of all is because this uh, pattern here is not a flat back on this side. It's got the pins, the alignment pins. So I had to drill, locate and drill these two half inch holes here so that this will lay down flat and I got X marks the spot there. So I will take this out now to the foundry and you see that lays flat and uh, ram this up, pour it. I only have one flask that size so it'll be two pours. I'm off to this, uh, off of center a little bit so I have room for a sprue and a gate. Now several of you have asked me well why are you using only one sprue? Don't you need vents? Blah blah blah. You, I, I usually get away without any vents. Uh, it's just an extra job but you definitely need them if you're using water-based sand and you'll see that that people that are using that are also poking wires into the sand so that the, the steam and the other vapors can get out. Now uh, that's not such a problem with the uh, oil-based sand Petrobond that I use. Uh, and remember the sand itself is permeable, meaning that some of the gases and that can escape. Now if it's a failure I'll do it over again because uh, all I'm paying is the, the cost of the natural gas to run my furnace, a little bit of electricity for the blower. So this uh, plaster has come a long way as far as drying. It's still a little bit moist to the touch but so much drier than it was the other day. And then uh, the, the sample that I made, the, the test sample, from uh, you know even longer ago is quite dry now but I'm not using this one. Um, in addition to that um, if I was going to make a lot of these I would varnish these or, uh, or paint them or something like that but really it's just a one of so it's kind of a waste of time to, to uh, paint these patterns and uh, if you recall again in the last part of the video I put pattern draft on all four sides. Flattened this just a little bit. Notice that one of these is a little bit thicker than the other because when I poured the plaster here I was a little short. That was where I had lost the, uh, the footage to show you that part. I don't know what happened to it. Okay I'll see you outside in the uh, cold garage here presently. A quick review of the terminology here on a flask. This is a flask. It's got two halves. The top is called the cope. The bottom is the drag. The drag portion has the pins. The cope just has holes for the pins. Now that's one my small round flask. I'm not going to use that. Now sometimes you might notice that in my work I'm, uh, I have reversed the cope and drag and I'm doing it in a slightly different unorthodox manner that you may not be used to or you may disagree with but whatever works for you is what you're going to do. Uh, you need to do because this other stuff would be uh, production stuff where it really is important uh, the order and the exact method that you use but uh, I'm going to do it just a little bit different now in a lot of my videos lately I haven't I've just glossed over this business here of uh, foundry because it's shown in many of my earlier videos but I think I'll show a few more of the steps in this one since uh, everything else in this incredibly long uh, video is so detailed. Now I still won't show just everything but I give you a little idea what to do without going back to the other videos but if you do like uh, foundry work, molding, casting then do go back to the uh, uh, other videos which are much earlier and they're on one of my playlists. Also some pattern making. I'm using Petrobon sand which is an oil-based sand 
And uh, every time I use it, I run it through my uh, muller here, which is called a m mini mite. I think it only does about 50 pounds at a time, but for my small use, it's just fine. Put it in this uh, hopper right here. I just use this red scoop. Scoop. This all came from a school. Not from the same school, though. And then the finished sand, when I drop the bottom here with that uh, lever you see there, the sand drops into this bin, and then I scoop it out to make my mold. And I mainly use that uh, mold sand up against the pattern, and I, I sift it in the riddle, and then later on, to fill the mold, just the uh, sand from down in the bottom of the bin is just fine. And there's my flask all set up, ready to go. And again, I'm, I'm doing this a little different than uh, what you might uh, do, because this is the cope portion. Notice the handle's down, but, and uh, this, it's 48 degrees, I guess I just said that, but the sand is even a little colder. Now, these uh, rubber gloves here, afford no protection from the cold but the uh, and the <laughs> but uh, it is so terribly hard to get that sand and oil off my hands when I'm done so that's why I'm doing that because I'm gonna eat a sandwich here in about 30 minutes then I don't have to scrub so hard but I just do that on one hand because that the right my right hand is my working hand I guess you could say so to start with I will see I gotta wear a jacket out here which is Kind of inconvenient. I'll dust that a little bit with parting sand, parting dust. I used to call it lycopodium. I think it came from Russia. <laughs> 